Good evening, and welcome to the 169th Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. The Landon Lectures began in 1966 by the late Governor Alf Landon and the late K-State President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent thought leaders to Kansas State University to discuss the pressing issues of the day. We're very pleased to welcome John Avalon and Margaret Hoover to the Landon Podium to join 168 predecessors in bringing their thoughts and opinions on important public issues. We appreciate tonight our campus leadership being with us, and I'd like to introduce several of those members in the audience. I'd ask them to stand and please hold your applause. To begin with, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jackie Hartman, Chairperson of the Land and Lecture Series and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President. Dr. April Mason, Provost and Senior Vice President. Dr. Barry Flinchbaugh, Chair of the Land and Patrons. Dr. Andrew Bennett, President-Elect of the Faculty Senate and Professor and Head of the Department of Mathematics. Pam Warren, President of University Support Staff, and Jessica Van Rankin, K-State Student Body President and Junior in Political Science. Please join me in giving these folks a round of applause. We also have one other person that I'd like to introduce who's undergone a bit of a title change in the last 48 hours, and I'd like to introduce uh, General Richard Myers, who's agreed to serve as Interim President of Kansas State, and I'm cleaning out my office, and he'll be starting there next week. Dick, please stand, and thank you for your service to K-State. John Avalon is Editor-in-Chief of the Daily Beast, author and CNN analyst. He is a registered independent who believes that hyperpartisanship is hurting our country because it's stopping us from solving the serious problems we face. He is also the author of Independent Nation, How Centrists Can Change American Politics, and Wingnuts, How the Lunatic Fringe is Hijacking America. He won the National Society of Newspaper Columnists Award for Best Online Column in 2012. John was the former speechwriter for New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. After the attacks of September 11, 2001, he and his team were responsible for writing eulogies for all of the firefighters and police officers who died in the destruction of the World Trade Center. Margaret Hoover is a CNN political contributor and has written for the Wall Street Journal, the Daily News, the Daily Beast, and FoxNews.com. She is author of the book, American Individualism, How a New Generation of Conservatives Can Save the Republican Party. She is a moderate Republican who is socially liberal and fiscally conservative. As a descendant of former President Herbert Hoover, she delights audiences with prominent family history and delves into the dynamic legacy of her great-grandfather as a humanitarian and pioneer of the international non-government organization. Please help me welcome John and Margaret to Kansas State University. Good evening. Thank you very much for having us tonight. Thank you for spending part of Friday. We appreciate it. It's a Friday it. night, and you're here with us. We're so... Could have been anywhere in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Margaret Hoover, and this is John Avalon. And we want to thank you first, uh, President Schultz, for the generous introduction, and Jackie Hartman for receiving us here today, along with you, Dr. Flimbaugh. Thank you very much for escorting us around campus and showing us around and giving us a good, warm Manhattan welcome. <laughs> it's a very different kind of Manhattan welcome than we get at home, so I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, and, and what we want to talk a little bit about tonight is certainly the 2016 election, but uh, I think talk about our politics with a sense of perspective, because it's the thing we have least of in our political debates these days. And, and, and Margaret and I, you know, if we stand out from the pack, it's probably in part because we have very different, we come from very different places when we talk about politics, but uh, with, with some work and a lot of love, we've figured out how to uh, disagree agreeably and often find that we're, we're actually not ending up at a different place. We're just coming at it from different directions. And the direction I come from is that, as was stated, I'm a Republican. Uh, I'm a Republican that is pretty concerned about the future of the Republican Party and our viability to compete in the future. Uh, and especially to appeal to a rising generation of Americans that are known as the millennial generation uh, and represent 
the bulk of the student body here at K-State. I, one would assume and, and hope. No, they do. <laughs> In fact, statistically. The youngest millennials yeah. are 16 and the oldest are 35. Well, um, and there you go. That, I, I have nothing to add to my wife's statistics. I just know <laughs> when it's best just to concede and move on. Um, and, and what I'm going to be talking about is, is sort of an independence perspective on politics and, and uh, the hyperpartisanship we're uh, reaping right now with a very surreal election campaign. Um, and, and hopefully offer a little bit of hope about how uh, Rome isn't necessarily burning just yet. Uh, but it's bad, folks. Don't kid yourself. Uh, back in 2011, I published a book, as, as President Schultz mentioned, called American Individualism, How a New Generation of Conservatives Can Save the Republican Party. Now, I wrote this book because I was concerned that my cohort, my peers, and people that were just a little bit younger than me uh, didn't really have much positive sense, much of a positive sense or impression of the Republican Party. And the title of the book I chose because I was inspired by a philosophy that I first read about, uh, first in university, but had been kicked around the house as I was growing up, a book that Herbert Hoover wrote in 1921 called American Individualism. Uh, turns out you can borrow titles and it's not plagiarism. Uh, but, but, but truly it was an apt title for the book that I had. Uh, and I, I want to tell you because, you know, this is a, a time where John says it's unpre unprecedented political time. Um, we do have this unprecedented political moment where Donald Trump aspires to become the second civilian elected to the presidency without ever having served elected office. The first was Herbert Hoover. What many people don't know about Hoover, because he is so connected to the pejorative and to the negative economic, um, really, calamity of the 1930s, uh, is that Hoover was an orphan from a neighboring state, from, frankly, land that looks a lot like this. He was born in West Branch, Iowa. He was orphaned at the age of nine, sent west to live with relatives, and wound up in the first class at Stanford. Um, he, aside from being the president, was known as the great humanitarian. He was known as the master of emergencies. Uh, a great statesman in his post-presidency, really creating a model for the modern post-presidency. And even though he had never served in elected office before, uh, he had really catapulted to the heights of international leadership through humanitarian food relief during World War I. So when I think about sort of what Herbert Hoover did leading up to the point where he got to the presidency and what Donald Trump did, I think there's really a contrast that's worth noting. A um, hundred years to go today, Herbert Hoover was the chair of a thing called the Commission for the Relief of Belgium, which most people haven't heard of. It was essentially a, an independent republic of relief, the first international organization dedicated to the feeding of an entire nation during World War I. When the Germans invaded Belgium in August of 1914, they uh, occupied the population but refused to feed the civilian population. Because of the English blockade, the English didn't want, 80% of the food in Belgium was imported because it was, a post, it was an industrial nation. The population couldn't feed itself. The English didn't want to import food because they were afraid that the food would go to the occupied, or to the, to the um, the occupying army rather than to the civilian population. And so Hoover was tasked and asked as a volunteer to organize food relief for an entire nation. And his tasks included raising money from around the world through charitable appeals and government subsidies. He had to purchase wheat and corn and food from North America, South America, Australia, and organize the delivery of 80,000 tons of food to Belgium every month throughout the course of the war. Now, he was able to do this because he was, at that point in his life, uh, an international mining engineer who was living in London, which was the capital of mining finance, and had mining enterprises on five continents. He actually had the logistical expertise to be able to orchestrate this totally unprecedented relief effort. Um, he was able to arrange for the safe navigation of food through European waters, avoiding German U-boats, arranging for this complex logistical unloading of 80,000 tons of food into barges, sending it through canals, 
delivering it to mills, dairies, and bakeries, where food was prepared and then fairly distributed to a frankly uneasy population of 2,600 Belgian towns, all while keeping the food away from the Germans. Throughout the course of this endeavor, he was the only diplomat allowed to travel on both sides of the lines throughout the course of World War I. He knew all of the players at, at the table in Versailles, and so President Wilson asked him to help navigate the conferences at Versailles, which led to the treaty, which Hoover ultimately walked out on the conferences at Versailles, thinking that the reparations on the Germans would lead to another war. He was right. Uh, he then went on to serve in President Harding's cabinet and President Coolidge's cabinet as a Secretary of Commerce. Um, so this sort of 15 years of international domestic and public service is a very different profile, I think, than the profile you see today of one of the other office seekers um, who has not held public office previously. But at the start of the 20th century, it was around this time, Hoover came back to the United States and he wrote this book called American Individualism. Now he wrote it because at the rise of the 20th century, he had actually been part of a group of Americans, the last 137 foreigners that had been in China before being kicked out by the Boxers in the Boxer Rebellion. He had then also seen the Bolshevik Revolution, lost mining properties in Russia, seen the rise of fascism in Germany, and had seen what he called a sickness of isms. Sweeping the, sweeping the world in this tide of revolution. And he thought, well, first he was afraid. He was worried that these isms would creep across the Atlantic to the United States, fascism, Bolshevism, communism. And so he wanted to characterize what it was about the American experience that had made his life possible. An orphan from West Branch, Iowa, that wound up in the position of being able to keep one third of Europe's population alive during World War I. And so he called our ism American individualism. And the idea was essentially that we are, it, it was his expression of the concept of American exceptionalism. But it was the idea that America is built on a system of individuals, but what makes it uniquely American is that we are deeply grounded in a sense of voluntary service to others. So it's individualism tempered by a duty to serve your community. And that was, frankly, he was at a Quaker upbringing in West Branch, Iowa, and I think this is what informed his sort of international experience helping to feed the Belgians during World War I. And this truly is an ethos that is really channeled, I think, in the millennial generation, a generation that is deeply individualistic, but also deeply connected to their communities, whether it's through cyber connection or through voluntary uh, cooperation in their communities. Um, they are a global generation, a technologically literate generation, and a deeply service-oriented generation. And so I found that by, by frankly, channeling Herbert Hoover, um, we could find this template for really drawing on a Republican tradition and then using that to reach out to a millennial generation. So that's what I wrote the book about. Uh, and then the idea was by explaining the millennial generation to Republicans and what, who the millennials are and what they're about um, might actually help update the Republican Party to find a conservatism that could compete uh, in the political sphere for the 21st century. So Margaret was a little bit ahead of the curve on that one. Um, and, we're not, we're not quite there, is. but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, it's a noble fight uh, that my, my bride has taken on. Um, and it, it's one that I think, as in many things in politics and our, our political life, that when you understand the history, um, it gives you a little bit of courage to know that you're not alone. However distant that history might be, if you can find a tradition that you're trying to build on, uh, as you try to forge the future that you'd like to see for yourself, for your community, or your country, um, that creates a context that I, I find can sometimes warm us uh, when, when it can seem awfully cold and, and the winds are blowing in the opposite direction. But, but all of us, I think, you know, not all of us have, can look at history books and, and, and see our families. Um, but we all, I think, can take a great deal of comfort from our own history, uh, whether it's familial or, or country. And, you know, I, as 
as an independent, as a journalist, as, as an author, um, I don't come from a family that has had journalists and authors per se, but my, my grandparents' immigrant experience absolutely shaped me. Um, and I find that, as with many people who are within living connection to their family's immigrants' roots, uh, I grew up with a deeper appreciation for America inculcated in me and a sense of obligation to the opportunities that they provided. You know, um, I proposed to Margaret on the, the southern tip of uh, Manhattan, the other one. Um, and, uh, and it was part because you can see Ellis Island, where my grandfather came through at the age of, of three. And, you know, he was an extraordinary guy, uh, lived in Youngstown, Ohio, where he met my grandmother, who's 100 and still lives there and is amazing. And we just named our, our five-month-old daughter after her. Um, but, you know, he, he was a guy who made his way up, worked in the steel mills, went to medical school, served in World War II. Um, and I remember talking to him as a kid about politics. I was fascinated by political history, presidential history. And, um, and, and his favorite president, he was a Midwestern Republican, but his favorite president was Harry Truman. And now he had a little bit of skin in the game, I think, because of uh, you know, serving in World War II in the Pacific Theater. But it was a reminder to me that so much of our, our political debates today, when you look at politics in the rearview mirror of history, the parties fall away from the presidents. You may have ideological divides, but by and large, they are less relevant. And that's a reminder to us today. If we care about politics, because politics is history in the present tense, then we need to do the opposite, which is remember to see our politics with a sense of perspective. And when I started out working in, in politics and government in my 20s, I, I didn't go to Washington, which is a, another way of saying that I didn't drink the partisan Kool-Aid. Uh, where, you know, in Washington, you know, you go into a congressman's office and, and, you know, by what TV station they have on, what newspaper they have on the desk, you know what team they're on, and they think of it as a team. It's not significantly more sophisticated than that, folks. There's a little bit of, you know, ideological catechism they you know, inculcate, but it's not, it's really about what team are you on. And in, in City Hall, in, even in New York, um, in my case, working for a Republican, Rudy Giuliani, in a city that's five to one Democrat, um, the emphasis is much more basic. It's how do you serve the people? How do you make measurable progress? Fiorella Guardia, mayor of New York in the 1930s, said, there's no Republican, Democrat, or socialist way to clean the streets. And he's right. Um, it, it's can you get the job done? And, and, and that's an ethos which is obviously missing from our politics. And another great reminder of that in my life was, in, in the immediate wake of, of the attacks of 9-11, which were just a few blocks from where we all were in City Hall, to see that warm courage of national unity and to see all the partisan fighting, which at that point had been bubbling up but hadn't really crested, immediately evaporate in the face of, of a national challenge. And, and, and reminding us that we can't wait for these cataclysmic events to unite as a nation, that many of the challenges we face are slower moving. Um, and and when, when I left City Hall and began my work as a journalist and a columnist, I wrote my first book called Independent Nation to be a, sort of a, a, write a hidden history of centrist leaders in American politics and how some succeeded and some failed. You know, Harry Truman, Teddy Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, um, you know, sort of the, the, the presidents that don't actually fit into the way we think of politics, which it has to be a choice between the far left and the far right, that actually doesn't fit most American presidents or most American political history. And I wrote that book in 2004, and um, uh, the initial subtitle was uh, How the Vital Center is Changing American Politics. That proved to be a little optimistic. Um, so I balanced that out with my next book, Wingnuts, How the Lunatic Fringe is Hijacking America. Um, now, I actually was trying to make the same point from a different perspective, uh, which is that part of the problem with those of us in the center is that we have allowed the center, which I think is a place of, of common sense and common ground, to be defined by the extremes. Uh, that you know, we haven't stood up and spoken out uh, enough and played offense against the extremes and the interplay that exists between the extremes. Um, so I thought it was time to sort of you know, be a radical centrist and to take the fight to the extremes and to start to punch back. And I, I still believe that. I think we need more examples of sort of muscular moderates who straighten your civic backbone and wade into the civic debates and are willing to call out folks on the far right and the far left without magically believing in moral equivalence. 
But as you look at the, the, the dynamics of this presidential race, which are really a departure, not only from our best traditions, but from you know, anything resembling what we've accepted as normal since the 1860s, um, you know, it, it is, is worth remembering that this didn't happen overnight, that we have been playing with these forces for far too long, encouraging polarization and hyperpartisanship and ideological litmus tests and rhino hunting out the center right of the Republican Party um, and, and, and deep problems in the Democratic Party, which are starting to come to the forefront that we'll get into. And just to realize that this election, which has basically been conducted along the lines of extremism and insults, is a departure from our best traditions. This is not normal, folks, and we need to actually remember that when we go to the ballot box. This is not uh, our, our greatest moment as a country. I believe it'll all end up okay, but we are playing with real fire here, and so that's what we'd like to talk a little bit more about. Margaret? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as I approach this, I, you know, I'd like to see a Republican Party that's a bit more um, modernized, frankly, that can win national elections, uh, frankly, that's competitive. I mean, I, I have Democrats come up to me all the time and just say, Golly, it is terrible for us what's happening on your side. No one says golly side. to you. No one ever comes up to you and says golly. <laughs> I'm in Kansas. <laughs> You're translating New York? That's very kind. But they don't unfair. say golly, but what they say isn't appropriate. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the, the point is, you know, they want a competitive two-party system. Yeah. And they don't have a competitive two-party system because they feel that the Republican Party is not going to put up a competition. And... I frankly tend to agree with them. And part of the reason I agree with them is because of this work that I've done on millennials. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that the Republican Party has only won one of the last six national elections. Okay, so. Are you counting 2000 in that? I'm counting, no, I'm not. I'm counting 2004. I just, just checking. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> uh, it would be really, think about it, right? I mean, the, in terms of the popular vote, we have won one of the last six. So five of the last six we've lost. And if you care about having a competitive and vibrant two-party system, you have to have a strong Republican Party. And I think by studying the millennials, what you can see is sort of a, a microcosm of um, what's not working on the Republican side um, for many reasons. And, and I want to break down just a few characteristics about the millennial generation and then back into sort of what the Republican Party can do, I think, to be competitive. And then we'll get into the 2016 race. First of all, the reason people talk about the millennial generation as being anything significant is because in terms of sheer numbers, this is the largest generation in American history. All right? They've outnumbered baby boomers. In 2014, they finally surpassed baby boomers in terms of sheer numbers. But in terms of the electorate this year, there will actually be only 200,000 more baby boomers eligible to vote than millennials. 30.5 million millennials will be eligible to vote and 30.7 million baby boomers. So millennials will be 30% of the electorate. In 2020, they'll be 34% of the electorate and baby boomers will be 28% of the electorate, right? This is a huge block of the American vote. They are the most diverse generation in American history with 40% of them being not white 20% of them having at least one immigrant parent. They adhere least to traditional family structures. More have been raised with a single parent household. But families are important to them. If you look at all of the polling, and by the way, the Harvard Institute of Politics, the Gallup Organization, and the Pew Foundation have done extensive polling on millennials since 2010. All of them say that they, as teenagers, fought less with their parents. And frankly, when the economy bottomed out in 2007 and 2008, one in eight of them had boomeranged home and were living with their parents in the context of the chronic underemployment that had hit that generation. They place parenthood and marriage as a higher priority than financial success but they are not rushing to the altar. Only one in five of them are married, which is half of the share of their parents' generation at the same point in their life cycle. Interestingly, they mostly attribute this to economic reasons. They feel financially too financially insecure to start families. Part of this is student debt. Part of this is the economic malaise that the country is only really recently recovering from. They adhere least to traditional gender roles. 
in terms of how families are structured with a male breadwinner and a female caretaker being the sort of older uh, model that really represents more the, the baby boomer generation. Uh, only 25% identify formally with religion, organized religion, although a Reader's Digest poll said 67% say they pray every day. Um, they absolutely are the generation that has the fewest hang-ups about sexual orientation. 75% of this generation is in favor of LGBT, of freedom to marry, of, of same-sex marriage. 63% um, of millennial evangelicals are in favor of same-sex marriage. And they fundamentally believe that their friends who are gay should have all the same freedoms that they do. In their politics, they are essentially pragmatic. They're your people. <laughs> they, 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 you know, the, the overwhelming majority, 52% self-identify as independents, but when you ask them about their political philosophy, they say they're independents, right? They're moderates. There are a larger percentage now that are, can self-identify as liberal, close to 30%, 20% that self-identify as conservative, 50% that self-identify as moderate. They have a positive view of government, and this is something I always tell groups of Republicans, think about that. They actually, Ronald Reagan, first of all, the pro, one of the problems conservatives have these days is that every problem has a quote from Ronald Reagan to solve it. And <laughs> the, the, oldest, the oldest millennials were eight years old when Ronald Reagan left office. Ronald Reagan means nothing to the millennial generation. And so to continue to quote Ronald Reagan as a solution for the future of America is really, is, is such a throwback that it's, it's totally useless. Ronald Reagan said the problem, you know, he always said, you know, the problem is government. Government has to get out of the way. Millennials like government. They think government is a force for good in the world. And if somehow government has screwed up, it's the guys who are running it. Get those guys out, get new people in. That's, that's sort of how you fix a system. The number one thing, though, that drives their politics, and we are seeing this so self-evidently, though it, it emerged in 2012, it was certainly part of what swept Barack Obama into office, but is hugely driving the forces of Bernie Sanders, is authenticity. Um, the exit polls from CNN especially say integrity, level-headedness, authenticity are the most important elements for the millennial as they experience their politicians. Political identification. You know, when, when some pollster calls you on the phone and says, how do you identify? Are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? Are you an independent? Your willingness to say Democrat, Republican, or independent generally solidifies over a lifetime normally three presidential cycles, frankly. So it, it pours soft. Somebody who's not political, you didn't grow up in a political household. So normally it, it, the trend solidifies after three presidential election cycles of voting in the same party. So it starts soft like cement and then like cement hardens over time. A new generation as it comes of age, if it votes in three presidential election cycles for the same party, will, will likely self-identify affirmatively with that party for the rest of their lives. And so you saw the first generation, the first part of the millennial generation, begin to vote in 2000, but not enough statistically to really be that significant. 2004, there was really, they began to break Democrat. They went for John Kerry about nine percentage points more than George W. Bush. And then in 2008 for Barack Obama, as we all know, they went for 33%. More of them voted for Barack Obama than for John McCain. 2012 was a little bit better, and this was because of the economic malaise and I think the, the, um, the, the housing boom, the crisis. But still, Democrats won them by 23%. Now, if you ask the millennial generation who should hold the White House, by 20 points, they say Democrats. Right? So Republicans have essentially lost this generation. Well, and, and, and I, I got to say that if you look at the Republican Party right now, they're not doing their best to attract new voters. Um, I mean, what we've got uh, going on right now, I mean, aside from the spectacle of a party lighting itself on fire, is a, um, a, a real civic problem, right? If you talk to, you know, remember, the Republican Party began this cycle, and um, they'd done well in the midterms, and they had 17 candidates running, and 
People were getting all hot and bothered, saying this is the most qualified Republican field you've ever seen. Look at all the governors. We could have any number of presidents and vice presidents in this field. And if you had told people at that time that it would basically be down to Trump and Cruz, I mean, I think they probably would have jumped off a bridge. Um, and, now and, we and, are. And now we are. Um, <laughs> You know, to, to extend the metaphor, Lindsey Graham, who was one of the 17, who's always good for, for a quote. Um, senior said, senator from South Carolina. Senior senator from South Carolina said that the choice, this prospect of choosing between Trump and Cruz was like choosing between being shot or being poisoned. Um, he, it should be now said, is now actively uh, campaigning for Cruz as a better alternative to Trump, which makes him basically a poison salesman. Um, <laughs> But these are the choices, right? John Kasich deserves better, folks, right? I mean, he is a two-term mm. governor from a swing state, popularly elected, and he can't get arrested, right? I mean, he came in fourth in, in Kansas. Um, he, he is hanging in there, and he should. But, you know, traditionally in America, we elect governor's president. Why? They have executive experience. And, and all the crop of governors who had executive experience, who were from swing states, typically the profile of someone who would make a great candidate and a great president, got wiped out. And they got wiped out because of the virulent strain of rhino hunting that the Republican Party has been incubating for a long time. Rhino hunting stands for those of you who don't spend too much time in political circles. Um, you Republican know, in name only. Republican in name rhino. only. Margaret has been called a rhino. Um, but, you know, what happens is it's these, it's these purity tests where the party wants to chase out heretics and they start purging people if they disagree on any, you know, on a handful of issues. And so you burn down, you know, the big tent and, and you shouldn't be surprised when all of a sudden um, you, you've basically narrowed the base of the party to such an extent that the primary votes are not representative of the nation at large or even the party as it once was. So you're having an increasingly hard time electing candidates who can win a general election. You know, I won't dwell on all the dozens and dozens of reasons why Donald Trump is a really bad idea for the Republican Party in the country. They're somewhat self-evident. I'll get there. Um, and, and, you know, we, we at the Daily Beast, you know, we, we're, we're nonpartisan, but we're not neutral. And what that means is uh, that we will hit left or right. We, we don't have a team. I think partisan media is one of the real problems in American politics that's led us to this moment because it's brought one of the core ideas of civic debate under assault, which is that, you know, everyone's entitled to their own opinion but not their own facts. Well, partisan media makes people come to civic debates armed with their own facts. That's a real, real problem when it comes to actually bringing people together to reason together. And so one of the roles I think we can play to push back on that is insist on a fact-based debate. That means, A, you've got to be willing to hit both sides as appropriate, but B, you don't fall into the, on the one hand, on the other definition of how to mediate a political dispute. You call it out. And one of our missions is, at the Daily Beast is to confront bullies, bigots, and hypocrites. Uh, and Donald Trump at different times has been all three, some at the same time. So we're not on his Christmas card list, and that's okay with me. Um, but, but, you know, the larger problem that's created, uh, you know, the Crumps, Tru Cruz and Trump, uh, and marginalized the Kasichs, is really, really serious. It's about the parties being more polarized than the American people. It's about the incentive structures in Congress moving people to the extremes in elected office because they're never going to lose a general election because there are only 35 competitive seats in the House of Representatives. The only way they're going to lose their job is if they lose a partisan primary with low turnout to someone who's more ideologically pure than they are. So you get basically a bunch of you know, gutless weasels in Washington who are terrified of reaching across the aisle. Uh, and the safest thing to do is to do nothing. So it leads to deadlock. It leads to confusion. Why is that um, an indecision in a way that actually discredits our country? And, and why that is so deeply dangerous is that a lot of, frankly, what Donald Trump is tapping into, and Ted Cruz to some extent too, and, and you know, he's a one-term senator whose only achievement is shutting down the government, and he is incredibly, impressively, uniquely disliked by his colleagues. One of the quotes we had in one of the articles was from a Hispanic Republican who accused him of switching his position on immigration. And the quote was, T to know Ted is to hate Ted. And he's like the likable, responsible one right now, right, between Trump. So the, the dynamic, though, is, is, is deadly serious just for, for two quick reasons. One, um, this anger they're tapping into is about division and dysfunction in Washington to some extent. There is a frustration, 
Donald Trump is not wrong when he says the game is rigged. It may not be against him. He lives in a Donald-centric universe. But um, the, the, the game is rigged. People do understand that Washington is more divided and dysfunctional than it should be. But the people trying to surf off that anger are selling more of the same. You know, they, they're, they're diagnosing the problem, but they're selling more of the poison instead of a, a prescription to actually solve the problem. That's a long-term danger. And on the Democratic side, you know, the, the Bernie Sanders populist campaign has, has inflamed a debate of ideas in the Democratic Party. That's the nicest way I could say it. The guy's a Democratic Socialist who is on the far, far, far left of the Democratic Party or on the American political spectrum by any standard for four decades. I mean, this is a guy who, at the height of the Cold War, thought Castro had a better argument than, than you know, Ronald Reagan, who thought that the Sandinistas, you know, that he, bread lines, one of his quotes was in one of our articles, The Beast, that we unearthed when he was mayor of Burlington, that bread lines in Nicaragua were a sign of economic health. Um, you know, the fact that, that Hillary Clinton's having a protracted fight with him speaks to um, a lot of things, uh, one of which is, I think, the impact of the Great Recession on the millennial generation and a, a lack of appreciation for the struggles of the Cold War and, and the evils that occurred under communism um, under, under the, the, the rubric of you know, liberation, but also that the Democratic Party is not immune from this disease. It is, it is asymmetric. It is more of a problem than the Republican Party right now, but it's coming down the pike for the Democrats, and so they shouldn't be entirely self-satisfied watching their friends on the other side of the aisle light themselves on fire. Margaret? Well, so, you know, okay. <laughs> um. that, I don't know how to score that one at home. Maybe you all can help. That's sort of, you know, you got a point and I'll tolerate it, but really you should stop embarrassing yourself. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not that. It's here. Here's. Here's why you're right. Um, it's more fun to tell me why I'm wrong, I think. Here, here's, here's the problem. You often tell me demographics are destiny. And sure. I've been looking at the millennial generation. They're 40% non-white. Here's the, here's the problem with Republican math. Because there are people who will make the case that Donald Trump actually could beat Hillary Clinton. He's appealing to this white working class element. Maybe some Sanders supporters will support him. Maybe he could bring Wisconsin into play or Pennsylvania into play. And maybe there is a coalition here to be had. And here's why that is totally bogus. Demographics are destiny, as you say. And if you look at uh, what the GOP has coming to it, if, if the Republicans are going to win, you just have to, you have to get enough, you know, you have to get 69 million people to vote for you, maybe 70 million people to vote for you. Um, the groups that form the core of support for the Republican Party are older whites, blue-collar whites, people that are married, and rural residents. All of those groups of people are declining as a proportion of the electorate. The groups that vote Democrat now include millennials, solidly, by 30%, by the way. Um, that'll be 30% of the electorate. Mm -hmm. Minorities and single women, and those groups are all growing. So right now, there just simply aren't enough traditional GOP voters. So you're voters. saying calling Mexican rapist was not a good opening line for Donald Trump? It's not campaign? a good opening line for Donald Trump. Just checking. Um, nor, nor is continuing to build the wall or telling Muslims you have to, you know, we're going to wait at the door, we're not going to let any Muslims in. All of this rhetoric, not only does it not appeal to millennials or Hispanics, it doesn't appeal to white suburban voters who you need to win or to women who you need to win. Well, forget about the women stuff. So this is the point that I'm trying to make is that there aren't enough traditional GOP voters in the U.S. electorate to win. Like Mitt Romney won the highest percentage of white voters of any non-incumbent president in history, and he still lost by five million votes. And he won every significant white subgroup. He won men, he won women, he won young, he won old, he won Protestants, he won Catholics, and he won by really overwhelming margins, but he still lost by five million votes because he only won 6% of the African-American vote, he won 27% of the Hispanic vote, and he won 13% of Asian Americans. And that is just too abysmally low. The Republican Party has to have a message that, is, uh, that appeals. They have to have not just a message, they have to have policies that appeal and positions that appeal in order to grow the tent because there aren't enough people right now who self-identify as Republicans who will vote Republican to get the Republican Party over the finish line. And so if they pay attention to what's interesting to the millennial generation, right, they'll also be solving the problem of what's interesting to Hispanics and what's interesting to women and what's interesting. We will have policies that can actually appeal far more broadly. So what I'm trying to tell the Republican Party is you can't win a presidential election by grabbing at a larger piece of a shrinking pie. And 
this is this is something has fallen on deaf ears entirely among the two front runners in the Republican Party because Ted Cruz has premised his entire campaign on becoming the most uber orthodox conservative Republican ever to run for presidency because there is a myth that part of the Republican Party has told themselves, which is that if you're only the most conservative, then you will win. Because the problem with Mitt Romney is that he wasn't conservative enough. And the problem with John McCain is that he wasn't conservative enough. And there are three to five million missing white voters out there who are uber orthodox conservative, by the way, not religiously conservative, Republican modern movement conservative types that just stayed home. And this is what they look at the data and they look at the voter rolls and what they tell themselves about 2010 or 20, 2012. And so this is what Ted Cruz has premised his campaign on as being the most conservative. And so he's run essentially on a values voters platform. I mean, this is how he swept. Supposedly he was going to sweep the SEC primary. These were all of the states in the South. He was going to wrap up the evangelical vote. And then Donald Trump happened. And it turned out that all those missing white voters that were staying home that Ted Cruz was going to get came out and voted for Donald Trump. And so then it turned out that, well, maybe it wasn't because they were orthodox conservatives that they weren't staying home. Maybe Donald Trump was tapping into something important. And so I am, try to be very, very careful about separating Donald Trump from the energy that he's representing. I think you have some good thinkers on the center right who have really given good thought to not just what's happening with Donald Trump, but has, what's happening in terms of the failure of the Republican Party to offer real economic solutions and policies to a significant portion of the Republican base, this white working class base that Donald Trump has tapped into. And you know, you have intellectuals like Charles Murray from the American Enterprise Institute who's written extensively about sort of this phenomenon of the white working class that has been left behind. And when you have real family income of people on the bottom half of the income distribution that hasn't changed since the late 1960s, you have a hollowing out and a real economic crisis that is going to bubble up and represent itself in electoral politics. That's, that's what Trump taps into. Now, I don't think Trump had any idea that's what he was going to tap into. I think he was running for president to run for president, but, but he began to get it and, and has channeled that um, portion of the electorate. I think, sadly, because of the Republican Party's really market failure to offer economic solutions that are competitive and interesting and capture um, really the needs of this part of the Republican base, it's also merged with a real fever of protectionism, nativism, and isolationism that aren't healthy for the Republican Party either. So the, the problem with the Republican Party is that you know two-thirds of it are either for Cruz or for Trump. And none of those are going to create the demographic formula you need to get over the finish line in November. Match that with the possibility of, say it is Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Then you have, if you stack up, I mean, Hillary Clinton is not a likable candidate. In fact, historically high unfavorable ratings, shockingly high. But her unfavorable ratings in every demographic group, Hispanics, millennials, huge unfavorables amongst millennials. African American, you know, her, women, white women, Republicans are doubled and sometimes tripled by the unfavorable ratings of Donald Trump. So, I mean, the, the best gift that could happen to Hillary Clinton is if the Republicans nominate Donald Trump in terms of simply winning, because Republicans just don't have the combination of coalitions to create the sheer amount of votes it's going to take to, pat, to, to win in November. Well, and, and I guess the question is, you know, <clears throat> look, there's a tradition in America of, of following politics like sport, and that can be enormously healthy. Of course, the big difference is, is that, um, you know, it, it, it's not a game. It, it's our country. And um, this election, I mean, the fact that, five, that three out of the five candidates who are running for president are not credible candidates for a general election should concern the two parties and should concern Main Street voters. I mean, it speaks to the breakdown in the two parties right now. We have a market failure, and it's been coming for a long time. The parties being more polarized than the American people, ignoring independent voters, focused on reaching out to their own base rather than to the center to create and build broad new coalitions. 
So whatever happens in the fall, and, and one of the great dangers, of course, that how we got here is that, you know, extremes and activists hijack the process and they alienate Main Street voters who start to see politics as a peculiar cult with very little upside in engaging in. And, and then that's how the parties get hijacked even further. So we got to stay engaged, particularly if you're in the center of the electorate. We all have an interest in, in a vibrant two or maybe one day three party system. I, I will say that part of the reason we've seen this breakdown is that we've been sold a false bill of goods when we are talked to about American politics. And we're told we need to choose between liberal or conservative, the far right and the far left. And in fact, that's not the way most folks think. It's not the way most folks vote. And it's certainly not the way most folks govern. There is an older tradition to thinking about American politics that I wrote about in Independent Nation that goes back to the progressive era. It actually said the real deeper divisions in American politics are between radicals on the far left, reactionaries on the far right, and reformers in the center. And I think that's the way we should go back to thinking about our politics. I think it's truer to who we are. I think it's what might be needed to recenter our political debate. Because, you know, Someday this election's gonna end. I have it on good authority, it'll be in November. And, and, and then we're gonna need to actually get about governing again. And the real question will be how can we recenter our politics and rediscover our best traditions? Depending on who the nominee is, you know, maybe the conservative movement will reassess, maybe the Republican Party will reassess and start taking Margaret's advice. Um, but there'll be other folks who say, you know what, this is what we need to reunite. Let's focus on hating whoever the Democratic president is, if the Democrat nominee, you know, if the Democratic nominee gets elected. Let's assume that's Hillary Clinton, because if Bernie Sanders is the nominee, you know, we should come back in three months and talk. It's going to be a variation of a different theme. Um, and, you know, that attempt to unite a coalition in opposition is part of how we got here. You know, parties need to stand for something positive, not look for simply unity in opposition. Um, and the Republicans have a good argument they can make to millennial voters. Republicans have a good argument based in fiscal responsibility uh, and a strong foreign policy. If you look at, you know, independent voters historically, you know, they've been fiscally conservative, socially liberal, strong on national security. Republicans should be able to compete for them. Um, and, and so, and frankly, as we, whether you're talking about Manhattan, New York, or you know, or, or Manhattan, Kansas, a two-party system in a city or state is necessary to keep the other guys in check, right? I mean, you know, if, you, if, if things devolve to one-party state, it becomes a bastion of cronyism and usually corruption and incompetence. So a two-party system, or at least vibrant general elections, is necessary. One of the things right now, you know, Donald Trump said the system's rigged. I agree with him on this one thing. You know, that, that maybe we can start having a conversation about the kind of election reform we need to lead to more representative turnout with more open primaries instead of closed caucuses, redistricting reform so that politicians aren't choosing their voters, rather people choosing their politicians, that that might adjust some of the incentive structures that leads to this sort of mindless polarization, that leads to divided and dysfunctional government. That's one thing we can do, but we're also going to need to change the culture. And, and, and that's up to all of us. That's up to, you know, actually standing up when, when you know, the, the group think at our dinner table or a community meeting all is sliding one way, to, to stand up and, and being able to say no. You know, people are not organized into dividing parties into angels or devils. Neither party has a monopoly on virtue or vice, and we're going to vote for the person, not the party. And if you do that, you know, magically you'll find yourself the balance of power, but people need that courage. And we can do that by asserting a couple basic things. First of all, let's remember that democracy depends on an assumption of goodwill among fellow citizens. That's been almost entirely forgotten. You know, especially when we're living in one-party cities or states, there's a tendency to demonize the other. And, and, and you know, liberals do it to conservatives, and conservatives do it to liberals, and, and there's a tendency to dehumanize and delegitimize the views of the other people. There's no longer an assumption of goodwill. That's dangerous to the country in the long run. And we need to relearn that we can disagree agreeably again. Thomas Jefferson, in his first inaugural address, said, you know, every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We need to remember that. And, and why does this all really matter, right? Why, why does this all matter? Does the presidency really affect you? On the geopolitical stage, if you believe in American exceptionalism, you're damn right it matters, because other countries are right now offering, frankly, a challenge to liberal democratic capitalism 
whether it's Russia and China or the Islamic Republic of Iran. And one of the things that some of these competitors do is look at American de democratic, democratic dysfunction, little d, and they see, see it's inefficient. And, 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 and we can offer you a way to get rich, and you may sacrifice a few freedoms, but it's much more efficient in getting big things done. You know, this is actually existential as well as the circus that we're all watching right now. I just finishing a book on uh, George Washington's farewell address, which he wrote in 1796, declining a third term as president. And he had the two greatest ghostwriters in history, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. Um, and in it, he wrote a warning to future generations. And, and he said the things, the three basic forces he felt that could destroy the American experiment. This is, this is 20 years after the Declaration of Independence, right? Hyperpartisanship, he called it factions, but hyperpartisanship, excessive debt, and foreign wars. So, yeah, it's a little relevant. And these are the stakes. You know, if we start making a mockery of ourselves through elections by parties nominating people who don't represent the vast majority of the American electorate, if we keep putting people to Washington who are invested in division and dysfunction, Democracy itself starts to look suspect, and that's when things get dangerous, and that's when all of a sudden the appeals of a strong man promising to come in and solve all problems with no details, the old demagogue's appeal of us against them, which is what we're seeing in a lot of these election debates, starts to look pretty good. So those are the stakes. That's why all this matters, uh, and that's why it's a reason to, to stay hopeful through all the insanity and stay engaged when everyone around you looks like they're losing their heads. Um, it's a real pleasure to talk to you, and we'd love to take some questions. More fun to have a dialogue than a monologue. Thanks very much. There are, there are microphones on either side of the aisle, so if anyone has a question, please we know we went a little go long, to but, either you know. side and come on down, and then we'll direct traffic. Can Kasich be the nominee and can he win? Margaret. Kasich, mathematically it will be impossible for him to get the 1,237 delegates he needs to get in order to be the nominee. But in a and contested he also, convention? And he, right. And so then there's this possibility of in a, in a convention, if we have a broker convention on the floor, can there be a floor fight and can uh, he possibly win? Um, there's a rule the RNC has created at least the last time um, when Mitt Romney was the nominee called Rule 40B, which says that also when you're a candidate, you have to have won eight states. So you, not just the 1237 delegates, you also have to have won eight states, uh, which Kasich is not on track to do since he has only won his one state. Now, it is possible that those rules could be rewritten, and they will be rewritten, and they might rewrite Rule 40B. However, the delegates who will be elected to go rewrite Rule 40B will most likely be overpopulated with Trump and Cruz delegates and have absolutely no incentive <laughs> to change Rule 40B because they want their guy, who has what well, both of them won eight states, to be the nominee. So at this point, it is very unlikely. But just the reality check, the obvious reality check is that here, Kasich is the one guy who consistently beats, who's still in the race, who consistently beats Hillary Clinton in head-to-head -head matchups and polling, and yet the party is ignoring him, and even the responsible folks in the center right who know better are ignoring him. So that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Are you saying prophecy. I'm ignoring him? No, 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 oh. no, no. I'm saying Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney are. You're much better looking. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so I'm a moderate Republican in, uh, here in Kansas, and that's hard to exist now. Um, we have an extremely right too far right Republican Party that's controlling our state. Um, how do we take care of that and what do we do to get the Can I the tee you up for one of your out? favorite riffs? Sure. Because you talk about, you know, how New York City, our Manhattan, is a one party state. Yeah. And Kansas is also a one party state. Well in it a looked lot of ways. like there was gonna be a really interesting election last time around and it just didn't break that way. I uh, yeah, Greg Orman. But but so so what is the I mean, maybe you can answer his question by also answering doing what I think you do so well, which is the, the dangers of the of the monopoly of, of one party rule. Well, right. I mean what first of all, I'm loath to talk about local politics. I, I, I follow Kansas politics more than you might imagine. Um, because I was actually really uh, really, interested in you know, interested and, and, you know, 
One of the ways we're going to break down sort of the polarization in the Senate is to have more senators like Angus King, the independent from Maine. Greg and, and Greg Orman running looked like he could add to that coalition. You only need a small number of centrist or independent senators to serve as a voice of reason and serve as the balance of power. And um, so I was paying very close attention to that race, and I paid attention to, the, to Governor Brownback, in part because you had a fairly ideologically pure imposition of a fiscal vision in his state, and it didn't seem to work out too well. Um, now, the fact that if he had lost, if he had lost, it, it would have sent a real warning shot, I think, to the Republican Party nationally. I don't know if it would have changed the under, you know, the, the underpinnings of the state politically, but it would have said that, you know, th that if you go about governing in an ideological way and purging your party, which is what I understood partly was the base of Greg Orman's support, see a lot of centrist Main Street Republicans who'd been systematically purged by the governor, and, and this is what ideologues do. This is what fundamentalists do. Um, look, I think you got two or three choices, right? I mean, first of all, get really involved in the next gubernatorial race and try to take back a party. Two, build the Democratic Party if it is willing to reach out to the center, and it may well be, um, or try to create something new, which is the most difficult thing. Fix the Republican Party. Um, but, 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 I, but I will say, you know, the tradition, you know, I, as an independent, I can't vote in New York primaries, and I had a fight slash debate with a, um, a, the former Democratic Party chair, a guy named Denny Farrell, and he said, well, if you want to participate in the process, join the party. And I said, well, you know, there are countries where that's true, and it shouldn't be that way in the United States of America. Um, you know, I, I get nervous. One of the, the things is if all the political fight is occurring within one political party, you're never going to have representative turnout. And, and, and it's going to end up being a factional fight between two warring groups of insiders. And that itself is unrepresentative. So, so I do think, you know, Opening up Absent, primaries. open primaries is key, and I'd also have you know, a system of redistricting that creates the closest you can get to a competitive congressional seat so you can at least have a chance of a general election. Um, but but you've you got to stand up to these folks because it's not going to happen on its own. Yep. Hi, so I'm actually from Kansas, and I grew up in a Republican household. Um, and so something that I've heard a lot of talk about is because of the rules change that uh, is going to, ha that can potentially happen right before the Republican National Convention, there's been a lot of people talking about the p possibility that they'll change the rules to allow someone else to come in for the Republican Party and kind of try and steal the show from Cruz or Trump. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts on what would happen within the Republican Party and the people's view of the Republican Party if they were to, to tr try and do something, let alone succeed in doing this. The Hail Mary pass, okay. Uh, you know, it's, there is, there, I think most of that talk is generated by, frankly, a lot of my peers who sit around and talk about this stuff on cable television and are running out of things to say and, until Donald Trump says the next outrageous thing and then you talk about that for four days. And, and, and so there's a lot of sort of, it's, it's like a parlor game. It's like, oh, right, well, who, and also, and then, frankly, there are a lot of sort of disenfranchised Republicans like myself who sort of have daydreams about, some, you know, a white knight who can come in and save the Republican Party. Should I be concerned about that? <laughs> <laughs> you're my white knight. Uh, but, but, but you're not a Republican. That's true. <laughs> so you can't save them. And so the likelihood, I mean, when Paul Ryan came out and said as clearly as he possibly could say, the person who is, by the way, going to be the chair of the RNC convention. He is going to oversee the entire process. Yes, it's in, you can't control all of the delegates. The delegates can, in the rules committee, make the rules for the convention and make the rules so that somebody who didn't win eight states, so somebody who didn't run for president, so somebody who didn't um, compete in all of the primaries could get the 1237. They could make it so that, I mean, whoever it is has to still get the 1237 delegate votes. Um, but I think you're right. I think it would be very damaging for the credibility of the party. I think it would alienate, hugely alienate, 66% of, of the delegates there who are going to either be for Trump or Cruz. Um, so I think the likelihood is quite low. I mean, I'm, I think, um, here's what I think is likely to happen. I think the likelihood of Donald Trump reaching the 1237 um, is not sure at all. It is likely that he will be just a little shy, um, looking for it. And this is what, look, this is like what weathermen do, right? Like weathermen are wrong all the time. But 
the probability, if you look at the, you know, really looking into California, which is 53 congressional delegations, so it's essentially like 53 micro primaries. And you can sort of tell which way each of these congressional delegations are going to go. And so you make your best guess based on who the, what these congressional delegations are and how many there are. Plus, considering, consider that Donald Trump wins New York, gets the bulk of New York, gets the bulk of the mid-Atlantic um, states in New England, along with Kasich getting some and Cruz getting some. He may, the likelihood that I would bet that he doesn't quite get there. But the question is, if he has... And one magic number is 1,100. If he has over 1,100, there are enough unbound delegates that if they get their act together and get organized, which it appears that they're beginning to do, they may be able to cobble together the other 137 bound, unbound delegates to get over on the first ballot in the convention. The conventional thinking amongst sort of the Republican consultant classes, if Trump cannot get to 1,237 in the first round of voting, on the convention floor, Cruz has to get it on the second ballot because there is some, there's, there's real thinking that if Cruz doesn't pull it together for the second ballot, he won't get it for the third. Um, after and the then, first and that's ballot. The, that's the Kasich scenario. And that, that's, where, that's where, you know, people start to really think of it. The, the one other piece of information that's, that's useful is that after the second round, after the first round of ballot, balloting, 72% of the delegates are then unbound. But after the second round, 60% are unbound. Which is, which is one of these areas where people think Cruz may not have enough delegates to get through the second round. And then that's where it could get really interesting by the third round. So more than you my wanted to know about that, math, but you're going to hear a lot more that, about that later. My guess is that Trump gets organized and is able to pull it together for the 1237. But chaos but who knows? almost certainly reigns. Who knows? That's just my guess right now. There, you or? can hold me to it. OK. <clears throat> uh, so far, we have not heard anything about money. And it seems to me that there's sure. 20 or 30 percent on the right that are well funded, 20 or 30 on the left that are well funded, and the middle is not well funded. Mm -hmm. And funding drives media. And the collection of the two seem a lot to me to be driving what's going on. So how in the world do you ever break up that partnership? Well, so, so a couple things about that. Um, first of all, um, because of Citizens United, unless we have a movement to repeal Citizens United, uh, which Hillary Clinton has said she backs, um, and the president has uh, thought about proposing formally but hasn't, you know, you've got that Supreme Court decision. Um, you know, if you, if you read that decision closely, Anthony Kennedy's done some great things in his career, and he's done some really probably not helpful things, and that falls under the latter, especially because if you look at the decision, the details. Um, you know, Byron White, uh, who was a conservative Democrat appointee of John F. Kennedy, uh, had worked in politics. So uh, the absence of anyone who's worked in politics on the Supreme Court leads to a lot of broad sort of theories that are not necessarily uh, conversant with how political reality and, and among, other, the, among the many problems of Citizens United, and Margaret and I disagree about this, is that the, all the enforcement tools designed to lead to his utopia of total disclosure depends on a, a, a highly functioning IRS a, um, and FEC, Federal Election Commission, which has basically been designated toothless by design. So, so the regulatory sort of clarity isn't occurring. Now, the one thing I'll say is that, you know, Jeb Bush raised $110 million, and he couldn't buy the nomination. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump agree on nothing. In my mind, they're wrong on almost any, everything. However, um, they, I think, both have tapped into frustration in the sense that part of the rigging of the system is related to big money. Um, and Trump has proven that you, you know, high name ID does not necessarily need to come from money. It, it helps in his case if you're shameless and you're a celebrity demagogue and you're willing to say crazy things in order to get a lot of attention. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and he's money, so he's self-funding. Uh, but but this is a larger issue because it's eroding people's faith and trust in democracy. And that's one of the things that those two folks are tapping into. And it needs to be taken seriously. Uh, and I, I would love to see a, an effort to repeal Citizens United because I think that's what it's going to take. All right. One more question? All right. One more question. Which side did we go last time? To this side, okay. Uh, it, so this is more of a hypothetical question, but something I was really curious about while you guys were talking. Um, say the general election does come down to uh, Trump and Clinton. Um, what do you think the 
what do you think the chances of Trump getting the nomination are um, based on like his performance in debates? Like if he does really You mean well, win the election? You mean winning a general election? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, you know, look, I think it's a big mistake to assume that anything's foregone. I think most Republicans will tell you that, you know, that they're incredibly nervous about the prospect or Trump or Cruz when it comes to things like keeping on the Senate. But, um, you know, obviously Trump is a talented campaigner slash effective demagogue. Um, I don't think you can discount the role of celebrity in his rise, by the way. Um, and there are always X factors you can't account for in elections. Um, so, you know, while all the demographic math that Margaret delineated is right, and it is, will be incredibly difficult for, I mean, you know, if, if you've made a cornerstone of your campaign, you know, in, in, in insulting, you know, Mexicans, women, Hispanics, women, Hispanics minorities, like, every... you're not, yeah, you're not going to cobble together that majority, but there's always the danger of an external X factor. And, 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 and that's what the rest of the world will be looking for. You know, are we susceptible to a Berlusconi, to a Putin? You mean, um, you mean if there were a terrorist yeah, attack or if something? If a terrorist that attack or God, yeah, sort God of forbid, a, some, 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 some external, external factor. You're saying things that happen in campaigns are external events that you can't external imagine. External events that, can shape that. that. Into God the forbid. Shape of and if someone was, you know, God forbid someone decided to try to, you know, uh, put their thumb on the scale in effect through exterior events. I mean, I th my guess is, uh, I mean, look, no, knowing what we know now about how the electorate lines up, Donald Trump has been truly the most polarizing figure, certainly in the millennials' lifetime in politics. Um, but he's, I mean, 78% of Hispanics dislike him. 72% of women dislike him. Frankly, 30% of Republican women won't vote for Donald Trump, right? So what... What Hillary Clinton needs to do is assemble the Obama coalition, right? She needs to put together the high, I mean, Obama only won 40% of white votes, but he won such high percentage of the other um, African American votes, minority votes, Asian American votes, Hispanic Americans. So Hillary needs to put that together again. Those groups aren't particularly energized by her election. They haven't really turned out in big numbers in the primaries. To the extent that they have, especially in the millennial cohort, they're far more energized by Bernie Sanders. But the thing that could really codify their excitement that's right. is voting against Donald Trump. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, the, that's the thing, right, is that the enthusiasm gap will be eclipsed in a stop Trump movement from a rising demographic standpoint. And then, and then the real big picture and the real fight to watch folks is what happens afterward. You know, if, if all that occurs, what lessons does the Republican Party take? They would take very different lessons from a Cruz being a nominee or a Donald Trump being a nominee. A Cruz loss versus a uh, Trump loss. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, at what point, I mean, Hillary Clinton is pretty well positioned to, to unite the disparate and I think increasingly divergent factions of the Democratic Party because she's got credibility on the left, at least to some extent. And, and her husband really set the model for how a party can revive itself. Remember, you know, before Bill Clinton ran in 1992, the Democrats had lost three consecutive elections with more than 40 states. And it took forming the, Repub the Democratic Leadership Council, the DLC, uh, to help revive a centrist, a centrist Democratic tradition. Um, and the Republican Party's gonna have to do the same thing. Uh, or we, we should start, you know, maybe there is more in common between the center right and the center left, and the far left and the far right should go split off and, you know, you know, ha have fun and, and let's see, you know, where there's more of us when it comes to governing in sheer numbers. But, but you know, what comes next is going to be at least as interesting and as important as what comes between now and November. Thank you. Folks, let's uh, thank our speakers one more time for a great thank evening. So. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much.